Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week we'll give you some tips on how to clean a popcorn ceiling because you're going to get some dust and dirt up there. How do you clean it without taking the popcorn with you? We'll share a few tips with you on that. Also, how to repair garden statues. A lot of people have little gnomes and little different things out in their yard. How do you repair when they get a little damage? We'll share with you a few tips on that as well as how to repair a towel rod when it's come out of the wall and a whole lot more. And I've got a simple solution on how to convert a five-gallon bucket. Is is there anybody who doesn't have an empty five-gallon bucket laying around? Well, they're pretty handy. And I'm going to show you how to convert one into a really handy cutting station for whenever you're hand-cutting wood, pipe, anything like that. Okay, we got a lot to do here, so let's get started. We have a few recorded calls that came in that we want to tackle a few of those, starting out with, uh, let's see, um, husband calling for wife Deborah. Uh, okay. So he, he he let it know this is not his question, <laughs> but Deborah wanted to know. Let's see what he says. Yes, Danny, I'm calling for my wife, Deborah Dahl, and what she'd like to know is how do you clean the uh, popcorn ceiling around the vents of your air conditioner uh, so that uh, it blows out and it collects dirt? And how do you clean that without knocking all the popcorn off? All right. Well, that's a good, good, good question. And uh, right now, people that have popcorn ceilings are probably looking up, going, "Yeah, I want to, I want to know how to do this." Well, you have to be very careful. And the thing about um, the popcorn texture around heating and cooling ducts. It can be where it will release and turn loose more so than other areas because it's getting hot, it's getting cold, maybe a little condensation from time to time, maybe loosening that, that, that up. So it really uh, is something that you need to be very, very careful with. And uh, an upholstery brush on a vacuum cleaner and use it very carefully, not to rub it, but it's almost like just a te- you know putting it up to the ceiling and just watching very carefully to pull that dust off is one way. You also can be very successful with just a, um, a a light broom, just to broom it. You'll lose just a little bit here and there, but for the most part, the dust is able to attract um, away from that pretty good. Joe, you got any other tricks on that? Because you do have to kind of handle that in a delicate fashion. Yeah, it often depends on the thickness of the popcorn texture and how old it is. If it's relatively new, relatively thin, and adhered well, you can brush, you can be a I wouldn't say aggressive, but you don't have to be too afraid. The other thing you could try, if it's not just dust or after you brush off the dust or vacuum off the dust and there's still some um, like dirt caked on there, try one of those magic erasers. Um, don't scrub it, but you know, just press it up against it and you, you, you'd be surprised how that attracts, sticks to it and might be able to pull it away. There you go. Just just be just be easy on it, and I think you'll see that you can improve it um, um, very, very well. Let's go to Florida right now. Mary Ann's on the line. I am making a... Oriental Garden, and I have two statues in there, one a dragon, one a Chinese Mandarin, and they are broken. They they fit together. Is there any kind of cement or glue or anything that I can cement them and you know put them back together again? Yeah, there certainly is. I'm not sure exactly what these are made of. I'm assuming they're some kind of ceramic, right? And then, I don't know if they're hollow or solid, but I, I, let's let's assume that they're hollow and they're ceramic with a glaze on them. That's what I'm imagining. And you could, you, you, whatever you use, you want to make sure it's clear because you know, you're know you not going to be able to hide the seam probably where it's cracked. And so you don't want to accentuate it with something that's dark in color. So I would, I would either use an epoxy that's relatively clear or it's never 100% clear, but it's probably close enough, which is super strong and that would work, or a clear silicone. Um, th- that's probably what I would work. And both would, would hold up outdoors. Okay, let's go to Diane, who's in Colorado. What is the best way to repair holes from a sagging towel rod holder? It is drywall, and I want to be able to put my towel rod back up in the same spot once I fix it. Okay, all right. Well, Diane, what you'll want to do is carefully remove 
um, your towel rod where it is now, um, I would suggest um, using some uh, traditional joint compound, a small putty knife, and go ahead and just fill the hole up. You don't, don't worry about uh, where the hole was before. You just go ahead and fill it up completely and wait overnight. That'll get it nice and hard. Then you can go back and um, re-drill the hole. Now, I assume if it's tearing your drywall out that it is not has not been secured into a stud or it would not have pulled out. So if you don't have a stud there, then you'll want to use a toggle bolt and you can use a small one and you can just drill a hole. The toggle bolt will go inside the wall and then it springs open to support the towel rod much better than maybe one of the small um, anchors that you've apparently used before. And then just carefully tighten that down and then you won't have uh, you won't have that problem again. It'll tighten it up and the excussion that you have on the towel rod should cover up any of the patching that you've done if you're real careful with the patching and don't let it get outside the footprint of that excussion. Very common problem that that happens on that, and uh, I'll tell you, you know, people will, Joe, sometimes uh, um, maybe they thought it was a um, safety bar, you know, and, uh, you <laughs> grabbed know, a hold and, of it, and grabbed a hold of it, right. and uh, man, um, even when you have toggle bolts, sometimes it can just pull right through that drywall. Well, it's only half inch drywall; it doesn't take much, especially if it's been damaged. And if you're going to use a toggle, I always recommend a strap toggle. And the nice thing about those um, is that. They are held to the back of the wall. A traditional toggle isn't. So if you remove the screw, the toggle falls down inside the wall and you have to replace it. So uh, take a look at strap toggles. Those are usually the best type of toggle to use. Pete writes, we stripped wallpaper off the plaster walls of our bedroom. The walls are cracked and painted. I'd like to skim over the plaster cracks and the old paint, but I'm not sure what to use or how to do it. Please help. Um, I'll tell you, um, Joe, we're, we're looking at some of the walls at Chelsea's uh, house that she bought. It was right. uh, made 1959. has a you know gypsum plaster walls on it. It's not the old lathing and, and so forth. And it really doesn't have many cracks, but, you know, you, it just looks old when you have that. But, boy, the prospect that um, with, for, for Pete or for Chelsea to apply joint compound over an entire wall, okay. I mean, one wall, not not to mention four walls, a ceiling, and about seven rooms. Right, you know, That's a lot. Um, I mean, I'll tell you what. Even for a pro, that is a lot of work to skim it off. And I and I have not had a lot of success. I don't know about you, in sanding that down. Even using an eighty grit sandpaper on a sanding pole, you might knock the top off of that. Uh, but it just right. seems like that material is, is so rock hard. It's really hard to know what to deal with it. Yeah, well. Pete mentioned it's, it's paint on plaster, and if the paint is not in great shape, then that's a whole other issue. I mean, you have to remove that paint. But if the paint's fully adhered in relatively good shape, you can paint over it. You can skim over it, but first you have to apply, um, it's called a PVA primer. It's for polyvinyl acetate, um, which is spe- specifically made for putting on onto plaster prior to skimming it. And um, if you can't find a PVA primer, you can also use a a product called a plaster bonding agent. There's the most popular brand is a plaster weld. But in any case, this is all in the prep. And then once you do that, then you can skim coat over it. And they do have pre-mixed patching plasters. DAP makes one, 3M makes one. Um, and just follow the directions. You can usually put it on with a, a roller, dilute it, put it on with a roller, and then smooth it out with a 12-inch knife. Um, so if, he's, if the question is, can you do that? Yeah, you can skim coat over it, but you really have to prep it first because of it. it's been previously painted. Yeah, that makes sense. And that, that uh, prepping also will help build it up a little bit to keep you from, you know, to get you closer to that smooth surface sure, that, exactly. that you want on there. That can be quite a challenge. Words of wisdom from my buddy Joe Truini with our Simple Solution of the Week. Okay, thank you, Dan. I'm not sure how wise these words are, <laughs> but they're certainly handy. Um, this Simple Solution is another use for a five-gallon plastic bucket. I mean, most people have them, whether you're buying them or using them after a drywall job. They're just so handy. And this is one of the best tips I've ever shared because I use this all the time. I used it recently, so I thought I'd share it. And it's how to convert the bucket into what I just call a cutting station. Whenever you're cutting a board, whether you're using a circular saw, a hand saw, a 
jigsaw, it doesn't matter. You can convert the five gallon bucket. So you can start by using a jigsaw or even a handsaw, a hacksaw, it doesn't matter. You want to cut two shallow V-shaped notches in the top lip of the bucket, one directly across from the other, and then rotate the bucket 90 degrees and cut two shallow rectangular notches, each about one inch deep by three and a half inches wide. And again, position those notches across from one another. So now when you go to make a cut, you can put a board in the square notches and the rectangular notches up to you know, two by four or, or one by four or anything a little narrower because they're three and a half inches wide. You'd lay them across those notches, you kneel on the board and you cut the board where you need to. And the V notches are great for anything round, whether it's a metal or plastic pipe, a wooden dowel, anything like that. And then the bucket itself, you can either throw the scraps in it, and sometimes we call these scrap buckets as well, so scraps in it, the cutoff scraps, or the tools themselves for carrying it around. So uh, make one of these, you'd be surprised how often you use it. And of course, when you're not using it as a scrap bucket, you can just use that as a regular bucket. Well, that's a great idea and easy to create those notches in it to be able to Oh, absolutely. To do they don't have to be that neat either. I mean, you just notch it out. Another great simple solution, and you can see a lot more of them, over 500 of them, at todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions. Joe, we talk over the years about, you know, little tips that you learned, you know, and that you remember them. And yep. you just reminded me of one that uh, my shop teacher back in the eighth grade, I was a young fella, and we had to do a, a, a project, uh, and I decided to build a picnic table. Okay. And um, so, um, of course, you know, eighth graders are not going to turn you loose on tools, so they gave us a handsaw. So I'm over here a lot of cutting. Cut, cutting away on these two by fours and two by sixes. And my shop teacher, King David Wilson was his name. Wow, what a name. He King David about, Wilson. Eight foot tall and weighed a hundred pounds. <laughs> and and came over and said, Son, let me show you something that you will always remember and always use. And so I had my hand there, you know, gripped on that saw. He says, Point that finger at where you're at where you are cutting. Your index finger. Yeah, right. your index finger. And leave it there and then put a little pressure on it when you're sawing. And I said, well, you know, and the minute that I moved forward with that saw, it was easier, quicker. I was more accurate. Wow. And to this day, whether I'm using a hacksaw, any kind of saw, a Japanese pull saw, I don't right. care what I'm using. I've got my finger pointed at what I'm cutting. And I well, guarantee you, you next time you try a saw, put that in index finger out, point at it, and think about good old King David Wilson and the wisdom that he imparted on. Can that. I just think of you? Well, yeah, think of uh, me. I'll take. I'll take the. I'll take the blame or the credit, whatever. <laughs> whatever. However, it turns out. So. I'll let you know how the cut is. Then I'll. Then I'll call you back time for our best new product segment brought to you by the home depot how doers get more done now one of the best ways to soften up an outdoor living space and make it look more like an actual room is to add the right accessories you know it looks like a patio with a wooden picnic table but some cushioned furniture turns it into an outdoor living room but fabrics don't always look good for long out in the weather so rust-oleum is introducing a solution outdoor fabric spray paint. It's an easy way to refresh worn outdoor fabrics with color. It's designed so the fabric stays softer to the touch than regular spray paint and its UV and weather resistant barrier means that it's protecting your outdoor fabrics while it improves the appearance. So if you need a cure for faded outdoor furniture, cushions, pillows, and umbrellas, this might be just what you're looking for. So for more information on the Rust-Oleum Outdoor Fabric Spray Paint, check out Home Depot.com. That was just a matter of time before something like that, that comes like a around. Great idea, especially for umbrellas, because those really take a beating. Yeah, I, I know it. And you know, there's a lot of people. My my um, daughters uh, actually painted some inside furniture. Right. Uh, you know, it was one of those old kind of mauve colored things there, and I could pretty much do whatever you want to to it. And uh, they actually painted it. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those chairs that. You fill up a room, but not many people sit over right, in that yeah. particular part. And uh, it, it, it was just unique. It was off white color, right. and uh, it just added perfectly to her to her bedroom. And she sat on it, so I'm putting her shoes on and things like that. But uh, anyway, it was kind of interesting that. You can, you know, so much upcycling that's taking place where sure. you can just do a little bit of painting, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you get a little more use out of furniture. I love that kind of thing. Yeah, and I wonder, sometimes we hear from homeowners who are trying to shade a deck you know, affordably. We talk about those sailcloths, I think they yeah. call them, those uh -huh, big sure. triangles. Uh -huh. I wonder if you could use this on that as well, you know. That's a good idea. Make it last a little yeah. longer. Uh, I'll tell you, um, I have been pursuing a little 
little community service project on the side here uh, for um, a, uh, a special church that's um, near the University of South Alabama, which is the university around here, and and um, they're trying to get this, you know the students in this particular church group out out in the open a little bit, kind of get them out from you know inside with a with the social distancing and so forth. And I have been finding out more about tents than you can okay. ever imagine because I had this vision of this kind of cathedral style tent. Right, and I have found it. I think I'm. I think I'm just about narrowing down on it. And uh, the colors of the university USA, of course, are red, white, and blue. Makes sense. So this cathedral style tent goes up to 18 feet in the center of the tent. Right, and then it kind of drapes down. That looks like it. Like a circus it, tent. It, uh, you might circus say. tent, wedding tent, something right. like that. Yeah. And uh, but they are able to create the center part white. Left side's going to be red. Right side's going to be blue. Wow. And then the logo for the church will be right in the center of the white part of it. So it'll take away the wedding look to yeah, it a little right, bit exactly. and make it a little more festive. But uh, but I have certainly found out when you're talking about painting fabric, right. that's what I was wondering. One of the questions I have, is it dyed or is it painted? Right. And will the yeah. color stay on there? Yeah, I think it would have to be either silk screened or painted. I know yeah. it. Well, I'll, I'll find that yeah, out. Post a picture I'll... once that's done. That sounds cool. Margaret in Massachusetts says, do you have any thoughts on putting something uh, on my outdoor, my outside dryer vent? The lint just blows out onto my grass and I'm forever raking it up. I guess, first of all, Joe, it's uh, great that she's seen all of that lint because that means it is doing its job and moving out. Um, Matter of fact, if you didn't see lint, it would be a problem. What do you think of some of those kind of self-contained type of uh, vent covers on the outside? Uh, you do have to go by and open the lid and take the right. lint out, but I just kind of view that as one more maintenance thing you've got to do around your house, and a little bit of lint on the grass, I don't see really that as a big problem. Yeah, I'm not sure why the lint on the grass is a big problem, but I'll tell Margaret what I did several years ago, and it's still working great, and it's it's um, it's it's made by a company called Heartland Natural Energy Saving Dryer Vent, which is kind of a very wordy product name. That's but again, a big package, dude. Yeah, Heartland Natural Energy Saving Dryer Vent. And it's kind of hard to describe, but if you look it up, and it's not cheap. It was about 40 bucks. It's a large diameter elbow, plastic elbow, the amount to the outside of your house. And on top of it, there's a cap. And under the cap, which you can lift off, under the cap is a smaller cap that's upside down called a floating shuttle cap. And that floats up and down as the hot air passes through to let the lint out, and then it falls back down. And I've had it for many years. It's really easy to clean, and I've never seen any lint on the grass. So she might want to at least check that out. Here's a question from Pam in Pennsylvania. My daughter just moved into an older home that has vintage Marlite. Now, she used quotes around that, Joe. That means something there. I think, I think it means she's not exactly sure what it is. I, don't, is I, I think she means she doesn't like it. And it's, uh, and it's, uh, it's oh, an old, oh, you mean it's vintage. Old. Vintage. Oh, vintage. Yeah, yeah. Marla says that about me. Yeah, is that right? Here's vintage. my husband, Joe. He's oh, vintage. Vintage Joe. I'm like, wait a minute. Then I help. Then she helps me out of my chair, and <laughs> yeah, I come try on. to argue with her. Come on. Quit slobbering. Come on. Um, so, anyway, has vintage Marlite on the bathroom and kitchen walls. Can that be painted? I'm not exactly sure what Marlite is, but it's an off. It's off color in. Uh, it's off white in color with a su- starburst pattern. Oh, sounds lovely. Oh boy, uh, any suggestions would be appreciated. Thanks in advance. Maybe she can pull it off the wall and send it to you. You, can, <laughs> you, you just built a new house. Maybe yeah, yeah. I need some marlite up in the, I need in the some bedroom. A- accents over my. Um, <laughs> need some starburst patterns. Well, you know, um, you can paint just about anything, That's and right, certainly yeah. you can use an epoxy paint and clean the surface well. And uh, now marlite is a um, is a fiberglass type reinforced. Exactly. Um, surface wall, material wall panel, you, right. used a lot in commercial bathrooms and things like that, or maybe used to be used a lot in that. Um, but, you know, again, it could easily be painted, but I guess it would be good to explore removing that to see what's behind. He's probably going to find some glue, uh, possibly some fasteners along there, but it'd be kind of nice just to get rid of that and go back to an original wall. Yeah, I wonder why Pam didn't suggest that. Well, it's her daughter's house, and maybe her daughter wants to just paint over it. Maybe it's too big a project. But yeah, you can, as Danny said, you can paint almost anything thing as long as you prep it properly in this case i'd sand it lightly with 120 grit sandpaper remove all the sanding dust that's really important you can use a damp towel or rag or the best thing to use is a tack cloth which mm-hmm. you can get at any hardware store or home center um, and then you'd have to apply i think an oil-based primer mm-hmm. and then you could follow it up with a latex based paint acrylic latex top coat paint but i think you might need the oil base 
primer first. Yeah, that durability is something that will hold on to that slick surface. And so many times right. we talk about sanding things before you paint them, uh, things where you're just – a lot of times you're just knocking that little bit of gloss exactly. off of there. Because if you apply a paint to a glossy surface, it just doesn't have the stickiness that you really need for it to adhere to that subject to that surface as much as you need. So a lot of times just some light, light sanding like that almost – Think of it as a deep cleaning before you paint is certainly um, a big necessity. We're going to Tennessee. Warren is on the phone. Well, thank you for taking my call. Appreciate it. Of course. My pleasure. Tell us tell us about the old sinkhole. Has a, Have you lost any vehicles in it yet? Uh, no, but we bought our son a 2004 Mustang, and he's afraid to park on it now. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> He might be afraid to just stand there. Never mind, park his car. <laughs> well, seriously, we've talked to everybody we could imagine. I mean, from Lowe's to Home Depot. I mean, you name anybody, any mm-hmm. contractors. And it started off as a small sinkhole, obviously, about six inches, about mm, maybe two or three years ago. Mm-hmm. So they kept telling us to put rocks in it and, then, of course, uh, uh, concrete. Mm-hmm. And, but now it's about three feet in diameter. and. Mm-hmm. It's getting bigger and deeper, and it's cracking our asphalt. It's right in the middle of our driveway. Okay. So, of course. It's always, always right in the middle, so you can't avoid it, right? That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. So, so it's um, the center of the asphalt driveway, and, and so the asphalt uh, obviously is, is cracked and crumbled, starting to crumble in that area. That is right. Okay. Well, um, several things generally cause um, sinkholes like this. Usually the main cause is... Um, uh, roots that are deteriorating, that roots from adjacent trees, or maybe many, many years ago they um, cut a tree down and they have the root structure underneath that was not removed, and it is deteriorating slowly and causing the you know the the weight to come down on it like that. Another um, situation sometimes can happen is if you have water that somehow when it rains it's funneling under there, and for some reason once a small depression starts, then the water Water continues to feed into that area, and it just slowly deteriorates that soil completely there. But what I would think is if you have asphalt, probably what you need to do is cut that square out. And you can cut it in a nice symmetrical um, square to remove all of that asphalt and then dig down in there and find out what's going on because you'll probably find some some soil that's just not compacting properly. You can get all of that out of there, a little bit of, little bit of shovel work to dig it out. Then you can put in um, gravel or clay or anything that can truly compact. And then you just keep adding that, compacting it up to about an inch and a half thickness then go back with a real high-quality asphalt patch material and follow the instructions on it, and then you'll have that discoloration of the new and the old um, asphalt, but then you can go back with a good, thick sealer and seal over, a coating, I should say, and coat over the entire driveway. I think that's going to be your best bet to head off any anything that may be causing that problem. Well, we I didn't tell you, but we live on a hill, and... Um so the water does go down into this area, and we also live in the woods. So you probably hit the nail on the head, and I'll do exactly that. Yeah, well, I think you'll find that. And if you can divert any of that water from the uh, from being able to channel under there in any way, it certainly will help them um, down the road. But the thing about it is, when you um, cut that out, Warren, you'll be able to really tell. You'll be able to see if there's a channel of water coming in. You'll be able to tell if that soil that's under whatever you've put in there is deteriorating, and you'll be able to get down to some good solid soil so that you can uh, prevent that that from happening. That's a that's a scary thing, Joe. You hate you hate to see, uh, especially your driveway continuing to deteriorate. Yeah, like that's that. not a good look. I'm I'm so proud of my buddy Danny. Here he is, after all these years, still hitting the nail on the head. That's unbelievable. Good for you. I I'm, appreciate prou- I'm proud that. of you. And now it's time for our podcast question of the week. We'd love to hear a question from you. All you have to do is go to todayshomeowner.com slash 
podcast. This is from Iowa, and Mary asks, when we redid our kitchen, the floors were laid first, then cabinets were installed over the floor. Is there any way to change the flooring without tearing out the cabinets? Boy, I have I have seen that many, many yep. times. And, you know, a lot of times we get questions where people, you know, when they're remodeling their kitchen, they'll say, hey, I'm doing a whole kitchen remodel. Should I put the floor down first or should I put the cabinets down first? And I don't think there's any right or wrong uh, answer to that. Uh, I always like to put the floor down at least under where, of course, the refrigerator and where the dishwasher, um, dishwasher yeah. is. You know, you just have to make sure you have enough height there so that it gets in there. But in this case, yes, you can, uh, um, of course, um, depends on the floor as to how hard it might be because if it's ceramic, you can still go along with a, um, a saw or a Dremel tool and score the ceramic right at the kickboard and then break it out of there. Your right. cabinets will still be sitting on top of flooring, and then you can just put your new flooring down after you prepare the floor. Uh, vinyl floor, depending on what you're going down with, you may be able to leave the vinyl down exactly. and go right over on the floor itself. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, it's a pretty common question Mary has, but we're missing some information. What is the old floor made out of, and what is the new floor that's going down? And that's exactly right. If it's, you're putting down a vinyl floor, a new vinyl plank floor, you're taking up like an eighth of an inch, you can probably just go right over the old floor depending on what it is if it's wood i mean i happen to have hardwood in our kitchen if you have wood that makes it a little more difficult to cut out you can use an oscillating multi-tool to get up underneath the toe kick of the cabin to oh, cut boy. down For, to trim that off that's a whole week of your life you're going to be i was going to ask you over to help <laughs> yeah, oh, man. Uh, <laughs> so you know to cut it out because you would have to cut it out because if you add anything more the concern of course is how do you get your dishwasher and there's only so much play in the legs of a dishwasher, which, by the way, in case you're not aware, you can adjust the dishwasher up and down a little bit, um, but doesn't have four inches of clearance space, you know, so you're going to have to, the last thing you want to do is trap the dishwasher behind some new flooring, because what happens if they have to replace it? They have to tear up your new floor. That's right, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I would I would think if you can put down, if you're putting it on a floor that's thin enough that's not going to affect the refrigerator or, free, or the dishwasher, I would just leave the old floor in place and go right over exactly. it. Good question, Mary. I hope we've been able to help you on that. And if you have a question for us, uh, bring it on, todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. And thanks again for the wonderful reviews we've been getting. We we read each and every one of them, and we appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to give us those five-star reviews. That makes a big difference in the world of podcasts. Hey, thanks so much for being with us here on this Today's Homeowner Podcast. I'm Danny Lifford, along with Joe Truini. We'll talk with you soon.